everyone, and welcome to my lab. Are you ready to learn? Yeah! Are you ready to have some fun? Yeah! Well, let's get started then. There we go. Ready? <laughs> that got your attention, didn't it, right? That's what I want you to be doing, paying close attention to what's going on so that you can really enjoy and learn. Now, the experiment that we did had to do with a plastic bottle that had a cork on the top, two nails stuck on the sides. The nails are not touching on the inside. There's a little bit of a clear and colorless liquid on the inside that you cannot see. It's actually alcohol. And what I used here is called a Tesla coil. This is a device that generates a lot of high voltage. It generates anywhere between 10,000 to 50,000 volts at a frequency of about half a megahertz. And when I push the button, then the spark is generated. And what I want to do now is touch the spark to one of the nails and see if I can make the spark jump across the gap that separates the two nails. And we'll see what happens. You already have seen it once, right? So are you ready to do it again? Yeah. Here. Some of you are covering your ears. I see that. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Let's do it. Here we go. That was pretty loud, wasn't it? And the cork went all the way up. We do it one more time. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. Right over here, I have a piece of copper that's been cut in the shape of what? A tree. It looks like a tree. Thank you. And I have a liquid, a clear and colorless liquid. And I'm going to put this piece of copper in this liquid. Just drop it in there carefully. And we look for evidence or indication of a change. Do you see any change taking place already? Right. There's a color change taking place. This liquid is called silver nitrate solution. So we're trying to carry out a reaction between the copper and the silver nitrate solution. And we see an early indication that such a transformation is taking place. The next experiment that I'm going to do using metals involves the uh, piece of copper, uh, a piece of zinc, and a piece of iron. Those three pieces, you can tell they're solid, right? And they're, they're uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, stiff. So I'm going to take some copper sulfate solution. Isn't that a pretty color? And I'm going to take a zinc sulfate solution, put them into these two containers. And we're going to try to find out if the copper, zinc, and iron strips react with them. So I take that strip of copper. I put it in the zinc solution. And we wait just for a few seconds. We lift it up. We don't see any change. All we see is that the strip of zinc got wet, right? So now what I want to do is dip that strip of zinc in. I'm going to dry it off first because I don't want to contaminate the solution, right? We always use good lab technique in my lab. I take this and dip it in the copper sulfate. We wait for a few seconds. We'll see if after a few seconds there is any change. No change. So that is not a chemical reaction that has taken place on this time scale. So we take now the piece of zinc, the strip of zinc. We put it in the copper sulfate solution. We wait for a few seconds. You can already see that there has been what? you can see that the copper has deposited on this strip of zinc. So I'm going to put this on the side here. And I'm going to take this piece of iron and dip it in the copper sulfate solution. And what are we looking for? We're looking for a telltale, some kind of indication that a chemical reaction has taken place. And after a few seconds, we lift it up. And you see any change in the coloration? Yes, there is a change in the coloration. There's more on the back here. Uh, and you can see that this is also has undergone a chemical reaction. You know from experience that when iron is exposed to air and to moisture, what happens to it? What do you get? 
rust, you get rust. So metals, some of them are reactive, some of them are not as reactive, and we've seen now examples of how we can uh, find out which ones react with, uh, with what. What I would like to do now is take another strip of uh, copper and also a strip of zinc and put them in solutions, put these solutions, uh, the copper sulfate solution, I'm going to fill this up. That's a real pretty color. I really like this color. About halfway up, and then put some zinc sulfate into the other beaker, about the same amount. Then I'm going to take the strip of copper and put it in the copper sulfate, and the strip of zinc, there is the strip of zinc, and put it in the zinc sulfate, and nothing is happening. Nothing is happening at all. So I have a clock over here. Is this clock running? No. What's it missing? It's missing a battery, right? It's missing a battery. So <clears throat> I want to now see if I can construct the battery from the chemicals that I have here so that I can change the chemical energy into electrical energy. That's what I'm going to try to do. So I'm going to connect the battery lead, I'm going to connect the uh, clock lead right here, this clip right like so. And then I'm going to connect the other one. Is the clock running now? It's not running now because the electric circuit between those two beakers where the chemical reactions might be taking place is not complete. So I have to complete that circuit. And what I do is I take a salt, table salt actually. It's dissolved in water. We know it's soluble in water, but it's also been placed into this uh, form, this U-tube, and it is in a gel. So it's in a gel, and I'd see now if I can complete the electric circuit by dropping this in there. Is the clock running now? Yes. So I've made myself a simple battery using copper, zinc, and solutions of these metals. And chemical energy has been transformed into electrical energy. Can you? Thank you. Can you, tell, can you tell time by this clock here? Can you tell the time by this clock? Yes or no? Yeah, well, what's, is there something different about this clock than a common clock? What's the difference? There are letters. This, these, these are the letters of the, these are the symbols. These are the chemical symbols of the elements whose atomic number corresponds to the numbers we normally use on a clock. All right. The experiment I want to do now is one where I'm going to use some zinc that's been placed in this small beaker. Uh, it's metallic zinc. I'm going to add a solution that has zinc ions in it. This is a solution of zinc chloride. And we know from the experience that the zinc does not deposit on copper. So what we're going to try to do, as we often try to do in, in science, is try to uh, change the conditions of the experiment. So I'm going to heat this mixture. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to heat this mixture and using a burner. Because quite often, as you change the temperature, as you increase the temperature, then the reactivity increases. We're going to find out if this is, if this is really the case. And uh, whoops, I'm, I'm missing the copper pennies that I want to really put in here because I used the copper penny already here. So I, I know uh, uh, another person in my lab has been working on this, and that's uh, Gina. Gina, can you please uh, bring out some of the copper pennies that you have? Please welcome Gina Gilly. <laughs> Nice, shiny copper pennies. What, what, uh, what do you plan to do with them? Well, I'm going to put a couple of these in the solution that you have boiling over here. All right. And we're going to let them cook for a little while. Two of them right in there. And let's uh, make sure that they are, yeah, it's really cooking right now. So we're heating this mixture. We're both wearing eye protection. You know that, right? Just in case 
there's a problem, and we, we do that because we obey the safety rules. And we'll let this boil for just a few moments. So, uh, Gina, do you think this has been uh, boiling for no. just about there? Right, let's check those. Can you, can you find them? There is one here. Let me There's one there? Let's see if I can help a little bit here. Oh, I almost had it. I got one right here. See it? Yeah. Right there. Okay. Ooh, lost it. Sorry. Lost it? Okay, we'll try to fish it out. Maybe if we take the heat away a little bit here, we're careful with the flame, we can try to find it. It's like hide and seek. Yeah, it is. And we do that in science a lot. You got it? Yeah. Right there. You're going to what? Now rinse, rinse it off it in off. there? Yes, yes. Let's see if I can find the other one. Where's the other one here? Did you already get one? Oh, there it is. There's the other one. Okay. And now, what are you going to do next? Well, I'm going to put this in the flame until it just turns into a kind of a golden color. Oh, it's really hot. Wow, look at that. Very Thank nice. You. Can you see that? The copper, yes. <laughs> it, it, it looks like Gina was uh, successful in changing copper to silver to gold, hey. doesn't it? Ed? <laughs> <laughs> which, which was the dream of the alchemists, but now in modern chemistry, you know, we know better. What, what uh, Gina succeeded in doing is actually depositing some zinc on the copper, and that's why we have the silvery appearance uh, in this coin right here. And then when she heated the copper penny with the zinc deposited on it, in the flame, the zinc mixed with the copper and formed an alloy that you all know about. It's called brass. Yes, it's called brass. Now, brass is a very special alloy to Gina, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Why is that? I play an instrument that's made out of brass. And what instrument is that? I play the horn. Do you happen to have one here? Yes, I do. All right. I guess I can take my glasses off because usually it doesn't explode in my face. <laughs> so this is one of the instruments of the brass family and it's called a horn. And the brass instruments function on what we call an overtone or harmonic series. And to make a sound in this instrument, we can't just blow air through it. We actually have to buzz our lips, which kind of sounds like this. Sounds kind of funny on its own. <laughs> but then when you blow into the horn, you get what sounds like this. <laughs> so that's basically what musicians had to work with before the 18th century, before the horn got valves. And around the 18th century, they figured out, horn players figured out they could use their hand inside the bell to get some other pitches. Valves came along and then the horn players went crazy. <laughs> so let me play a musical example of what the horn might sound like in an orchestra situation.
Now, there, there are a couple of other people in my lab who also use brass, brass instruments. instruments. And uh, let's invite them to come out now. Would you please welcome Amy Schendel and Todd Schendel. As Gina was describing with the horn, um, we also produce sound on the trumpet pretty much exactly the same way. We have a mouthpiece here and we buzz our lips, which produces the sound, as I'm sure most of you are probably aware. Um, and actually, trumpet did not have these three valves um, like you see now. It was originally just one long piece of metal tubing that um, they were able to just pretty much play fanfares and stuff like that for royal families and, and so forth. But when we got these valves on here, we were able to play all sorts of different varieties of music, just like the French horn. We could play very fast and technical. Just like the French horn, we can also play nice and lyrically and beautifully. The trombone is the most unusual brass instrument because of the nice long slide and it can do a lot of different sound effects like these. Neatest things about the trombone is they can also play jazz, fun music. How about if the three of you play something together? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the Science is Fun Brass Trio, right there. I'd like you to take a look at this beaker again, where you see that the color of the liquid has become a bit darker, and also the pretty silver crystals are growing on the uh, branches um, of the tree. Well, we were doing experiments with the Tesla coil and the bulbs and the, and the light bulbs, so uh, let's continue to do that. Well, that got their attention too, right? So you remember what happened now with the sound energy was increasing as the size of the bottle went up, right? So what we should do now is protect our ears. And I'm going to use earplugs because I only have two hands, and that's how I'm going to do the experiment with the two hands. So here we go. You ready for this? Everybody's got their ears protected? I can tell you that this big bottle now is warm. In fact, it's quite hot because the reaction that took place, the ignition of the alcohol vapor, released not only sound energy and light energy, you saw that and you heard that, but also heat energy. What I would like to do now is with what's in this flask, which is hot water, just to keep the flask hot, and then I have a beaker and a smaller flask. I'm going to take the stopper off. I want to dump the hot water in the sink because I don't need it. It was just to keep the flask hot. So out goes the water down the drain. And we, of course, know from experience that for a chemical reaction to take place, we have to mix the chemicals. So here's the first liquid that I'm putting in there. And then I'm going to put the second clear and colorless liquid. And we're going to be looking for some kind of indication that a chemical reaction is taking place, right? I'm going to stop for this. I'm going to mix this. Now you can see that something is happening, right? Right? And so I'm going to mix this actually a little faster. And we'll watch and see if there are any more changes. Are there any more changes? Do you see what I see? I see myself now in here. Because what we have just made is a mirror. This is a silver mirror. And we've deposit deposited a thin film of silver on the inside of this flask, and we've made ourselves a holiday ornament right here, yeah. right? <laughs> and if you like that ornament, you'll like this one even better. So, when you, thank you. When you go around town during the holiday season, and you see ornaments this big, you know where they were made. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you for coming to our special 36th anniversary of this holiday lecture. And remember, no matter what you do, science is fun. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to have more fun with science, visit the Science is Fun website. There you'll find instructions for many entertaining and informative experiments you can do at home. You'll also find lots of other fun and fascinating information about science.